Now, in, in line with the uh, theme of the event, um, I, I also want to present a hopefully somewhat new perspective, and in my case, it will be a perspective on non-classical logic. Um, and I hope it will be one that even makes it even a bit interesting for people who come from the classical world, as it were, which includes myself. Um, so when I uh, normally work in, in philosophy, I'm, of course, presupposing classical logic. And when I studied mathematics before I turned to philosophy, I was studying classical mathematics and, 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 and so on. But I think there are some reasons to um, uh, become interested in non-classical logic, even uh, if you come from the classical world. And about some of these reasons I want to talk today. And uh, a, a starting point into that is the familiar distinction between different kinds of contexts. Um, say, for simplicity, um, sentential context. So um, take a, a, a complex sentence that contains a sentence A somewhere in between. Okay? So it's a construction on the sentence or on the formula A. And now take A and punch a hole into the whole construction where the A was. Okay? Then you get what's called a sentential context. Okay, so the thing with the whole is this intentional context. And now some of these contexts are, as people say, extensional, okay? as, you, as you know. So it means that the truth value of the whole thing will only depend on what the truth value is of the thing that you fill in for the blank, for the gap. right? Or in other words, you fill in the blank with an A. Okay? You replace A by a B that has the same truth value, then the overall truth value of the construction will not change. right? then the context is an extensional context. And I think it's fair to say that um, what's the logic of such extensional context? Well, presumably classical logic. Okay? When you say truth value. Yeah. I mean according to the standard rules for the time being. Tarski and semantics in the background. Okay? Because it's, uh, of course. Of course. I know. Okay. The whole world I know. But I want to play the classical okay. game. So that's how you would present things traditionally. And you know, in philosophy, it's been presented like that over and over again. But also in linguistics, in, in, all, these, in all these areas. Okay? OK, so classical logic, say classical first order predicate logic, might be the logic of such extensional context. Classical negation symbol creates an extensional context, for example. Okay? But then sometimes you have these intentional contexts. So you've punched a hole again. But then you observe that the context is not extensional in that sense. Okay? But it might still have a different kind of invariance property. It might be intentional. Meaning, if you replace A by a B that's logically equivalent in classical logic, then the truth value of the overall construction will remain the same. Okay? Then it's an intentional context. Okay? Like the necessity operator in classical modal logic, it creates an intentional context in that sense. Okay? So what's the logic for these uh, contexts? Well, maybe modal logics, there are... There's more than one, as, as you all know. Possible world semantics typically would be a suitable choice of semantics for that kind of construction, and so on. Okay? But then, as it's been known for a long time, there is also sentential contexts that are not even intentional in the way that I've just presented it. Okay? So often these are called hyperintentional. Okay? And then the question, and that's a question so interesting for everyone, whether you come from the classical world or not, what's the logic and what's the semantics for these hyperintentional contexts? It's a generally interesting question. Um, and that's been around for a long time. So Cresswell, in a paper from the 1970s, uh, when he was dealing with hyperintentional contexts, he, he was already characterizing them as contexts which do not respect logical equivalence. And by that, he meant, of course, classical logical equivalence. Okay? So how do we give a semantics for that, and what's the logic thereof? Um, in the 80s, there's been interest in that. Uh, for example, in situation semantics. Okay? So that's Perry, Barweis. Uh, for example, that's an example from Barweis and Perry. Melanie saw Jim Eater and Jovi. Okay, so Melanie saw creates something like a sentential context, right? So you fill in the blank by Jim, Eaton, and Jovi. And now you can replace that by this here, Jim, Eaton, and Jovi, and Sarah eat a pickle or Sarah not eat a pickle. So you replace P by P and parenthesis Q or not Q, if you like. Okay? They are logically equivalent. But it might well be that the first sentence is true while the, last, the second sentence is false. Okay? And the reason might just be that the seeing context, right? So seeing very much depends on what the content of the seeing experience is like. Okay? 
if there is something in the seeing experience that's to do with Sarah eating a pickle or not, okay, then this might be well described in this way. If there is nothing about Sarah eating a pickle in the visual experience that Melanie had, then this might well be the correct description. Okay? Hence, the seeing context might drive a wedge between these two constructions, even though how you fill the gap is, um, it would be equivalent in, in, in classical logic. Okay? So it seems seeing might be an operator that's hyper-intentional, so how do you give a semantics for that? Well, situation semantics was supposed to be a semantics for that purpose. And in the meantime, lots of other operators, uh, especially uh, some coming from philosophy itself, have been argued to be hyperintentional in that sense. Um, for example, uh, um, operators to do with explanation, operators to do with aboutness, what a sentence is about, and, and the like. Okay? And currently, um, many philosophers are very excited about this. Okay? So there's a paper by Daniel Nolan where he's basically saying, yeah, I know the next century will be the century of the hyper-intentional revolution. And that, that's a bit, uh, bit too much for me. Okay? So I don't expect that. Um, but it well, might well be that um, uh, we'll find a new angle on non-classical logic, right? because we need to break sort of classical logical equivalence in hyperintentional context, there might be a new perspective on non-classical logic that derives from considerations like that. Okay? Whether it will lead to a big revolution in you know, logic, semantics, and the like, we will see. We don't know as yet. Okay? Um, there's a lot of work currently going on. Um, so <laughs> Kit Fine, for example, he's developing a truth-maker semantics that's supposed to handle many of these hyperintentional operators. Um, Steve Diablo uh, has worked on that. For example, Steve Diablo still tries to remain within possible world semantics. Okay? Whereas Kit Fine sort of um, throws away possible world semantics. Okay? And it's an open question whether we need to change sort of possible world semantics fundamentally or we, we can stick to it. Okay? And I, I, as far as I can see, there is no definite verdict as yet. So people are exploring options. Okay? So that's what's currently going on. Um, in any case, here's what might be a suitable scheme to treat at least many hyperintentional operators semantically. Okay? It goes like this. So you do something like possible world semantics, but you replace the worlds by states. And whatever a state is, let's assume it's something more general than a world. Okay? Something more general than a classical model, if you like. Okay, so uh, some of these states might be world-like. Okay? Uh, others might be of a, of a different kind. Who knows? Okay? Now, um, if, if you want your logic outside of hyperintentional context to be classical still, you could define ultimately logical consequence as truth preservation just in the world-like states. Okay? Then nothing is going to change. You will still have classical logic outside of your hyperintentional uh, uh, context, and everything is as it was, sort of. Okay? But within the context created by a hyperintentional operator, these additional non-worldly states might pay off. Okay? That's why the logic inside, the internal logic of the operator, might not be classical anymore. Okay? And how would you get a semantics? Well, you could still have something like, for example, a Kripkean accessibility relation, okay? but now it relates states with states, sometimes worlds with states, also worldly states with arbitrary states. And if some of these states are non-world-like, then the corresponding operators will be hyper-intentional, and there you go. Okay? And the rest, what you then get out of this, will depend on the details, but because this is just a scheme. Okay, you go. It kind of depends on what you mean by world. Yes. Because if you take it very abstractly, then the non-world is also... <laughs> Think, think of a world as something that evaluates formulas exactly in the way as you would evaluate them in possible world semantics. Or think of them as classical first order models for the time being. Okay? But then there are states that are not like that. And that will be the additional degree of freedom that you, that you can use here. Okay? But of course this is just a scheme, right? So what's a state? Right? First question. How do we evaluate formulas at arbitrary states? Presumably at the classical states, we will evaluate them classically. But what we will do at the other states, that's an open question. Okay? Now, look at truth preservation at all states whatsoever. Okay? That logic won't be classical anymore if things go well. But what is it like? Right? Um, and are there applications of such a system that go beyond sort of hyperintentional semantics? Okay? So these are all open questions, and they are currently discussed a lot. And I want to give one possible answer to these questions in my talk now. And that's the system which I call hype for hyperintentional that I'm going to present now. Okay? 
So in the following, I will not be so interested anymore in hyperintentional operators, but rather in the logic of all states in a state space, like the one that I've just hinted at itself. Okay? I will I study sort of the non-classical background logic. Okay? But ultimately, um, one of the applications of the system will be to hyperintentional operators. Okay? And I've already worked out one, one, one case study that's operators for causality. And there I think the system works really well. Okay? But I will concentrate on the logic and the semantics itself uh, today. And the system is going to overlap with lots of formalisms that have been around for quite some time. So I can't go into all the details in the corresponding paper. I discussed this in detail. But it overlaps with situation semantics. I already hinted at that. Frank Feldman's data semantics from back then. Truth-maker semantics of different sorts. Relevance logic and relevance semantics. Um, Many-valued and paraconsistent logics. Um, some variants of intuitionistic logics, for example, with different kinds of negation. Uh, and uh, inquisitive semantics, the semantics of questions that's currently been been developed. Okay, so there's an overlap with all of them. Um, I'll, I'm going to hint at some of these overlaps in, in in the course of the paper. But if you're interested in more details, ask me afterwards. Okay. And here's the plan. I'll first give you the semantics of hype, um, and I'll start even on the propositional logic level, and then we build things up to the first order level. Then I'll tell you more about the logic that, that is sound and complete with respect to semantics. Then I'm going to tell you that hype um, you can think of as a kind of framework in which you can discuss different logics, classical logic, intuitionistic logic, strong, clean logic, um, the logic of paradox, relevance logic, and the like, and how they relate to each other. Okay? So that's one, one attractive feature of the system, that within the system you can talk about different logics and how they relate to each other. And then I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of why the system is interesting in itself, other than its framework character. And that will be an application that's been interesting to philosophers for a long time, namely give uh, formal theories of truth for languages that are type-free, such that certain sentences can talk about their own truth or falsity, like with the liar paradox. Okay? And there, uh, using a non-classical logic in the background has been kind of a standard move. And you can use my system for that purpose, and it gives you certain advantages over the, the, the systems that are available already. Okay? And then I'll draw some general conclusions from that. That's the plan. OK, so let me explain to you the semantics of hype. So the language I will do with, in which I will, for which I will do that first is just the language of propositional logic. It's just that you should keep in mind that my conditional symbol will not express the material conditional. Okay? It will be a new conditional that comes with the system. Okay, with hype, there's a hype conditional. Um, uh, I use usual abbreviations. If I have barring over a propositional letter, I mean the negation. Double barring would lead you back to the original uh, propositional letter. Um, I have a logical verum in the language. Okay? If you negate the logical verum, you get, by definition, the logical falsum. Okay? So that's, that's my, my language, nothing unfamiliar. And then in the semantics, I will have formulas being evaluated at states. I will tell you very soon the formal details. Okay? Now, but just to give you an idea of how to interpret that, how to read that, it depends a bit on the intended interpretation of the hype model that you're building. Okay? But the idea will be that if S satisfies A, S being a state, then you can read that in the way not just that A is satisfied in S, but also A's subject matter is S. So in some sense, A is about S. Okay? Or you could say that S um, is a truth maker of A. Okay? And you know, truth makers have been around for a long time, both in semantics and in metaphysics. Okay? If you're interested in that kind of thing, my truth makers will be kind of inexact truth makers, as they say. Because this, this is going to mean that if S satisfies A and you add further information to S, then after adding further information, A will still be satisfied. So there will be a kind of monotonicity requirement. Okay? So Kit finds semantics, for example, that he's investigating is not of that kind. He's developing what's called an exact truth maker semantics. Uh, you could also think of the S uh, as a way for A to be true. Okay? So A is true maybe, but there could be different ways for A to be true, and S is Determining one of them. Yeah, you have a question or a comment? Yes, perhaps. But you want to. Uh, so the question is, uh, why do you sort of prefer in fine terminology in exact? Uh... Let me address that later. Okay, cool. Because it's better you first see the properties of the system. Okay. But the short answer is, 
Um, I don't think there will ever be anything like the canonical semantics for all hyperintentional constructions because it's such a heterogeneous field of operators. Okay? Okay? But for some of them, I think this will be a suitable semantics. Okay? And then we can compare with Kit Fine semantics whether, you know, what, what does a better job? Okay? For example, for the application to the semantic paradoxes, this kind of monotonicity requirement that we also know from Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic, okay? that will be useful because this will allow me to, to use fixed point constructions. If you don't have this monotonicity property, you don't have these fixed point constructions available. So I doubt that Kit Fine semantics, although it's really nice, I like it, yeah, will be helpful so much for semantic paradoxes, while well, this is. Okay? For other contexts, like he argues for grounding metaphysics, his semantics might be the better choice. You know? And that's perfectly possible as far as I'm concerned. In, in your uh, analysis of the causal... Uh, the there I think it works very well. With the inexact. With this inexact, yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so just to give you, before I give you the formal details, to give you a flavor. So in many ways, my states will look like worlds or models as, as we all know them. So for example, they are going to decide disjunctions. They will be closed under conjunctions. So this should all look sort of familiar, and, uh, familiar territory. So in particular, you will have, for example, that S satisfies P or parenthesis P and Q, just in case S satisfies P, the one disjunct, or P and Q, the other disjunct, and this will be the case just in case S satisfies P. Okay? So P and P or P and Q, they will be logically equivalent in my system. Okay? On the other hand, P will not be logically equivalent with P and Q or not Q. Okay? So that won't be the case. And remember, that's exactly uh, as it should be if you think back of the seeing example. Right? The seeing example just said you don't want in general P and P and Q or not Q to be logically equivalent. Okay? So we're on the right track here. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy, but uh, okay, we should, no. You go, go ahead. If, if, if it's short, it's fine. Come on, you. Okay. No, please. please. No, you said no. I, like, I, it's just I'm, I'm, if it gets too much, um, I might not go come okay. go through so it. You, in the previous slide, you have had many interpretations. Yes. Yes. But now with these definitions, you 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 better you somehow. What's the point of this interpretation? Uh, I mean, if you have a very liberal reading of this. Uh, uh, is about the disjunction. You could also think that oh, maybe part of S is about P and another part is about True. C. Then it is not. Yes. I don't think that, so even this word here, so a subject matter or about, yeah. that's underdetermined heavily. Yeah. Okay? And that's a familiar story in philosophy, right? What's aboutness? Okay? Okay. I'm not claiming for all notions of aboutness, you know, properties like this will be appropriate. Okay? I, but I think there is something like, as it were, an inexact notion of aboutness for which this will be suitable. Okay? But, you know, let's see what, what comes out of it, okay? In contrast with worlds, states may be incomplete, neither satisfying B nor not B, and they may be overdetermined, both satisfying P and not P. Okay, so this will be quite, you know, quite liberal. Um, and then you will be able to do things with states. So, for example, I will have a fusion operation for states. You take two states, you can fuse them, and you get another state, okay? So this is a bit like putting information together, as it were, okay? Um, and states may be incompatible with each other, so one state may be incompatible with another state. Okay? Meaning roughly they, these states have some components that can't be realized jointly, as it were. Okay? That rule each other out. Okay? And now I'll make that precise. Okay? And then we'll see what comes out of it. So this is what a model um, and with the corresponding model constraints looks like on the propositional level. Okay? So this is quite a mouthful, but let me give you the idea of what's, what's, what's going on here. So first of all, you have a set of states, not empty set. Okay? Then you have a function that gives each state sort of content. Okay? And the content is given by literals, propositional letters or the negations. So each state is supplied with stuff, as it were. Okay? Like, in, like in possible world semantics, you would do with worlds. Then you have the fusion function. Okay? It's partial. So there can be cases where you have an, a state S and a state S prime, but fusion is undefined for them. Okay? So it's a partial function. Okay? Um, where it's defined, the fusion of S and S prime is going to inherit whatever you have assigned as literals to S and what you have assigned as literals to S prime. Okay? So there's a kind of hereditary property. It's also allowed that once you fuse, new stuff emerges that hasn't been there, neither in, assigned to S nor assigned to S prime. 
Okay, so that's possible. But whatever you have below, you will have upstairs, as it were. Okay? Um, it's uh, idempotent, where it's defined, it's commutative, and it satisfies this requirement. So if, if these fusions are all defined, then if you have a fusion looking like this, so within there you find S. Okay? S is sort of already within the fusion. Okay? Then if you um, fuse S with this construct, you'll get this construct again. The idea being that S is already in there. Sort of nothing new is added. Okay? Now, you could also uh, um, do something more. You could uh, have a partial associativity requirement. Okay? And this would imply, as one can show, this requirement. So this is a bit weaker, but it just works sort of for the logic. This weaker requirement works just as well and has some additional benefits, for example, in the completeness proof. So that's why I'm, I'm using this weaker requirement. Okay? Then we have this incompatibility relationship. It's a binary symmetry. Yeah? If you use S with S, Yes. Sure. Then you'll get S. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. It will. Uh, by the way, since I'm now explaining incompatibility, it will be possible that the state is incompatible with itself. Okay. So just that you know already, that will be possible. If you think of states that satisfy both A and not A. Okay. Anyway. So this is a binary symmetric relationship, um, and the constraints are: if you have a state S and it already contains a propositional letter, say, and S prime contains the negation of that propositional letter via the V function, then these two states must be incompatible. Okay? Because this is going to satisfy V, this is going to satisfy not V, so hence they must be incompatible. I don't postulate the other direction. So you could have states that are incompatible, but that doesn't show up in terms of the object language. Maybe the object language is too impoverished to track all the incompatibilities between states. Okay? I allow for that. Okay? And again, you have a hereditary requirement. If you have already an incompatibility, and you add stuff on both sides, then the incompatibility will be preserved. Okay? And then I have a kind of general closure condition. So this is a postulate. Okay? It's a hype model, just in case. For every state S, there is a unique state S star in the same state space, such that these properties are satisfied. Okay? And the star, you might, if, if you know semantics for relevance logic, you might know what the star function is. So that, that, that's sort of where, where it comes from. And what it says here is, um, so the star image of S, first of all, has the property that if a, a literal is not assigned to S, is not assigned to S, then its negation is assigned to S star. Just a second, yeah? Okay? So in particular, for example, if neither P nor P bar is assigned to S, then both P and P bar will be assigned to S star. Okay? So for us, S star is sort of filling gaps. Okay? On the other hand, if both P and P par, uh, bar are assigned to S, then S star will have neither P nor P bar assigned via the V function. Okay. Secondly, if you apply the star function again, you get back. Okay, so S double star is identical to S. Okay. And S and S star are not com incompatible with each other. And indeed, S star is, in, as it were, the, the largest state that is not incompatible with S. And that's postulated in this final, in this final postulate. Whenever you have a, a, a state that's also not incompatible with S, then that state is, in a sense, already contained in S star. If you fuse that state with S star, you get S star. Okay? So in some sense, S star is the greatest state in your state space that is compatible with S. And for every state S, there must be a state S star that, has these post that, that satisfies these postulates. Okay? Yeah? If you have uh, two states, yes. how uh, can you to define the identity? Well, identity. the identity of states? Well, this is just the set. So there's nothing special here. You have a set of points, like, uh, like a set W as a set of worlds in possible world semantics. Because I guess the question is yep. the, the evaluation value of the of mm -hmm. state determines it. No, not necessarily. Like in, like in possible world semantics. Like in possible world semantics, you can have two distinct worlds. They are two different elements of the set, but they satisfy the same formulas. There That's possible in possible world semantics, and the, the like is possible here. Is there any criteria to define if two states are different to the same? Yes. Well, if you mean identity and difference, you don't have to define identity and difference, right? I use as meta-language set theory, and that's the identity predicate that you have. And it's not defined, it's 
There's no special answer. But maybe you, you, you want to say for some purposes, for some semantic model theoretic purposes, maybe it can be useful to identify certain states with each other because they behave in the same way or so. That's a different question. And we can talk about that later if you're interested in that. But other than that, I don't understand your question. Uh, OK? Good? All right. So a state can be incompatible with itself. Yes. Yes, absolutely. For example, if it satisfies both a letter and its negation. Yeah. OK. So to give you a better feel for what's going on here, first of all, modulo the, the, um, the fusion operation, you can partially order states. Okay? So you say a state is less than or equal S prime just in case the fusion is defined, and if you fuse them, you get the right-hand side state. Okay? That gives you a partial ordering. Okay? So states are really partially ordered by the fusion operation. And what the star function does, it is reversing the order. So it's antitone with respect to the partial order. Okay? If S is less than or equal S prime and you apply the star function, then you get the reverse ordering. Okay? So that's, that's easy corollaries of, of uh, the definition of a height model. Okay. Now let me give you, relative to such a height model, the satisfaction clauses. Okay? So now which condition will a state given in such a height model satisfy a formula in, in propositional logic? So there is no f strange things going on uh, for the propositional letters or the literals, even conjunction, disjunction, verum, that's all as promised. And you know, no. the, the interesting cases concern negation and the implication. Okay? So let me explain the semantic rule for negation. It goes like this. A state satisfies not A, just in case, for all states S prime that satisfy A, it holds that S, the state at which we are evaluating, is incompatible with S prime, the states that satisfy A. Okay? So in words, S satisfies not A if S is incompatible with every way of A being true, if you think of S satisfying A as a way of A to be true. Okay? So for example, a state will satisfy that Hannes is not um, not walking from the hotel here within a certain period of time, okay? it will satisfy the state, will satisfy not A, okay? Hannes is not walking like that, if it rules out every way for me to walk from the hotel to here within that period of time. Okay? It rules out me walking fast, it rules out me walking slowly, it rules out me walking straight here. It rules out me walking meandering, in a meandering way here. If all these ways for me to walk from the hotel to here in that period of time are ruled out, are incompatible with the state, then the stat state is going to satisfy Hannes is not walking um, from the hotel to here. Okay? That's the idea. So I take this to be a very natural semantic rule for negation. Um, and you know, something like this you know, has already occurred in some semantics for relevance logic, quantum logic, so this is not unheard of. That's what I hinted at at the beginning, right? This overlaps with existing formalisms. And similarly for the conditional, so in, a, in an algebraic semantics, the conditional would be something like being given as a residual by a residuation operation, okay? And it goes like this. A state satisfies if A then B, just in case for all states S prime that satisfy the antecedent, and where the fusion of S, the state at which we're evaluating, with such an S prime is defined, it holds that when you fuse them, the fusion satisfies the consequent. Okay, so again, a very natural operation. So again, in terms of a little example, say we are at the state where I've already uh, walked from X to Y. Okay, these are positions now. I've already walked from X to Y in that state S. Okay, and now say the antecedent says that I will, I'm also walking from Y to Z. Okay, and the consequent say says I'm walking from X to Z. Okay? Then this corresponding conditional will be true in the state. Why? The state already says I've already walked from X to Y. The antecedent adds that I'm also walking from Y to Z. So take the two together. I'm walking from X to Z, and that's by assumption what the consequence says. <coughs> okay? So this is how this is going to work. And actually, I have a little graph theoretic example of a height model later in which exactly what I've now sort of described informally is going to be the formal content. Okay? So this is like linear integration. Okay? Yeah. And again, you know, something like this has been used in other contexts, uh, of course. Okay? If you collect within a model all the states that satisfy A, you get what I call the hyperintention expressed by A. Like in the possible world semantics, if you collect all the worlds that satisfy A, you get the intention expressed by A. But that's now the hyperintention, right? That's the idea. Okay. So, um, as you can see, the satisfaction conditions for not and if then, they are not local but they are, in a sense, modal, right? You need to quantify over states in general beyond the state at which you're evaluating, OK? 
Okay, so in some sense, negation and weave then are modal operators now in that in that context. However, it's easy to see that if a formula does not include the conditional, it might include the negation, but not doesn't include the conditional, then the truth value is still determined locally. Whether a state satisfies a formula without the conditional, you can already extract from the V function at that state. You don't have to look at how formulas are evaluated at other states. Okay? So if you forget about the conditional, everything is local. Even negation becomes local. Okay? The non-local character enters because of the, the uh, conditional. Does yes, in the, in the definition you have to look at other things, yeah. but you can just prove by the closure condition, that's to do with the star function, that if, you, if A doesn't include the conditional, this boils down still to something that's local. Yes. So this becomes, in, for certain A's, this becomes equivalent to a local condition. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. So it's really just when there's a conditional in the A that you know, something non-local is happening. Okay. okay. You have monotonicity. That's already as promised. So that's a bit like Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic. Um, and you have the star satisfaction lemma. A state satisfies not A just in case the star state does not satisfy A. Okay, so that's how S, S star, and the negation relate to each other. Okay? And, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, Routley back then had a semantics for negation and relevance logic where something like this was used as the semantic rule for negation. Okay? And I always thought, you know, where does this come from? What's the justification of it? Okay? So this always has remained a bit unclear in relevance logic, I think. Okay? But in my case, this is just a lemma. It's something that you prove. This is not the semantic rule for negation. I've already given you the semantic rule for negation. Okay? And that seems to me the more appropriate way of doing it. Okay? All right. So this is what a state space in hype looks like. Um, so you might have in the middle some states that are not incomplete. They don't have gaps. Okay? But they are not overdetermined either. So these states don't satisfy any A and not A simultaneously. Okay? So they are like worlds, and they are sitting in the middle. Okay? Then you might have states, they don't have any uh, A and not A being satisfied simultaneously, but they might have gaps. Okay? There might be some incompleteness in this. So here, for example, this, this state neither satisfies P nor satisfies not P. If you apply the star function to it, then this gap is filled by both P and not P being satisfied at that state. So you only have gaps here, and you apply the star function, you have states here that are overdetermined, but you don't have any gaps anymore. And Applying star function again, you get back. And you have, if you have mixtures of being overdetermined and incomplete, and you apply star, you get mixtures again, and so on. Okay? And in the middle, sort of the fixed points of the star function, that's the worlds, as it were. That's the picture, typical picture of what a state space looks like. Okay? Why do you describe them by not incomplete uh, rather than complete? Um, did I? Did I? No. Oh, here you mean? No. no, no, no. Oh, well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I could. Yeah. Not incomplete. yeah. Well, as I said, in the, on the meta level, okay, I like classical logic, so say complete. Um, that's perfectly fine for me. There's nothing behind that. No, no. No tricks. No tricks. So here's a little example. Okay? So this is a, a geometrical, as it were, example of a, of a hype model. Uh, so take this kind of Euler, Euler, right? <coughs> Euler Venn diagram here. Um, so you have four elementary regions, x1, x2, x3, x4. And um, by fusing them, sort of putting them together, you get states. Or formally, look, take all these sets to be the states in your state space. Okay? Even the empty region, as it were, is counted as a, as a state, okay? for simplicity. And then you give these, these literals as stuff to, to, to states. For example, you give this one P, this one Q, this one not P, not R, not Q, not R, and so on. Okay? There's a little twist here, just for fun. Okay? If you fuse these two regions, so you take this as a state here, so the set containing x1 and x2 as members. Then I also give this state r. Okay? Although r was neither here nor there. Remember, that's possible. Okay? You can create new literal stuff by fusing. That's perfectly possible. Okay? So you, you turn that into a model. Fusion is given by union. Incompatibility for simplicity is just given by um, two states are incompatible if you assign, have assigned a v to the one state and a v bar to the other one. Okay? Just for simplicity, let's turn that now into the definition of incompatibility. Okay. So, for example, um, this region here and this region here, they will be incompatible, right? Because here you have assigned a P and here you have assigned a non-P. Okay. But this region, X1 and X2, they are compatible. Okay. And then, you know, uh, for what does the star function, if you turn, have turned it properly into a model, take, take this region here 
and now fuse it with all the regions with which it is compatible. So you add this one, and you can also add this one that's also compatible with P. You can't add this one because that's incompatible. Okay? So if you fuse X1, X2, X4, then this will be the star image of X1. Okay? And that's what you have here. Okay? And then you use the machinery to evaluate formulas. Let me give you just one example. here. For example, look here. So here I say that the state satisfies, satisfying X1 satisfies if Q then R. Okay? So this state here satisfies if Q then R. And r roughly the idea to think about it is take the antecedent that's Q. Okay? So this is the minimal Q state, the least Q state in that model. And for finite ones, you can always look at minimal states. That's, that's enough. Okay? So take, take the minimal state that satisfies the antecedent, this one, fuse it with that one at which you are evaluating. Then you get this state here. Okay? And then check whether this state satisfies R. And indeed, by definition, it does. I've assigned R to that fused region. Okay? So if you add to x1 that state, it's going to satisfy R. This is what's expressed here in the semantic claim. Or you can also, in this case, view of it differently. You start with the consequence, so that's R. And then you subtract the antecedent, the Q part. And then you are left with a part that's x1. And that's what you find on the left-hand side. So in some sense, the conditional is like a, a subtraction operation for contents, as it were. Okay? And again, just to give you a pointer to the literature, Steve Jablo's work on aboutness is a lot about these subtraction operations. Okay? And that's a subtraction operation for content in action, as it were. Okay. So that's how this works. Here's another graph theoretic example. I've already uh, advertised that before. So you have a directed graph here, uh, five vertices and the edges, as you, as you can see them here. And now think of the states as being sets of pairs E, I, where E is an edge in the graph and I is 0 or 1. Okay? So states, say, are sets of colored edges. Okay? And instead of coloring, you can think of 1 as expressing that I'm walking along this edge and 0 as I'm, I'm not walking along this edge. Okay? Something like this. Okay? And the states are sets of pairs looking like this. Okay? And then you have your propositional language, but instead of writing the propositional letters as P, Q, R, let me write them like this. So you take a, a vertex, or if you prefer a name for a vertex, okay, V, V prime, and you have an arrow. Okay? And basically, this propositional letter stands for you know, the path from V to V prime. Okay? And you set up your interpretation function, your evaluation function, V, accordingly. Okay? So that, for example, V1, V2, arrow, that propositional letter, will be satisfied by all states where you have a, 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 a turned on edge E1 within the state. Okay? Sort of the propositional letters reflect the existence of certain paths now that have been turned on in the state. Okay? That's the idea. And now you turn that into the model, and then what you find is that the propositional connectives using the hype semantic rules, they get a kind of interpretation. Okay, of the following sort. So these things, by definition, that's sort of the interpretation walking from one vertex to another. Okay? So the formulas express actions, if you like. Okay? Negation is a blocking action. Okay? So let me give you an example here. So for example, this state where I turn on E1, E2, and E3, that satisfies this propositional letter. right? Because this path realizes a path from V1 to V4. Okay, that's why you have this here. Okay? Now take the negation of that. Okay? Then uh, uh, here are some states that satisfy the negation. These states are such that they have to block all paths that would lead you from V1 to V4. Okay? So for example, if you have a state where you block um, this line here, so this is turned off, and you block E5, this line here, then obviously there is no path anymore sort of left sort of from V1 to V4. And indeed, using the semantic rules, it turns out that this state satisfies the negation of that propositional letter. So negation, and this is, works even if this was a complex formula, A, rather than a propositional letter. So the negation operation linguistically expressed sort of the action of blocking. Okay? And then you have something like this for conjunction and disjunction and even for implication. Okay? So for example, um, this state here, where E1 is turned on, this state satisfies if V2 to V4, then V1 to V4. And remember, this is like my intuitive example initially. Okay? If you have a state where you have already walked from V1 to V4, 
then if you add, that's the antecedent, that you will also walk from V2 to V4, then in total you have walked from V1 to V4, and that's what's expressed by the consequent, hence the conditional is true. So this, this is how this works. Okay. Now you can look at the hyperintention in such a model. Um, since this is all finite, it's really only interesting to look at minimal states satisfying formulas. Okay? And if you look at these minimal states and you collect them sort of, again, into something that might also be called hyperintentions again, then you find that they have a well-defined structure that mathematicians have been interested in for a long time okay? in different areas. Okay? So in combinatorics, these are called sperma families. Okay? Uh, in optimization theory, they're called clutters. In graph theory, they're called simple hypergraphs. That's my hyperintentions. Okay? So, for example, the set of edge sets of paths from a node to another in a directed graph, that's a typical case of a Sperner family, or a clutter, as they would say in optimization theory. That's what my hyperintentions look like in such a model. Okay? And then, uh, the, uh, for example, in optimization theory, what the next thing they do is, for every clutter, they define the blocker of the clutter. And you can already hear the sound, what a blocker roughly amounts to. It must be something like negation, right? And indeed, what they define to be the blocker corresponds semantically to what is expressed by my negation symbol according to hype in that model. Okay? Uh, so it's basically, what's a blocker for them? It's a set of cuts that separate a, a node from a node in a graph. Okay? And that's exactly what corresponds to what is expressed by negations in my system. Okay? And then they show things like, so the next lemma they would show, okay? they show that the blocker of the blocker of a clutter is identical to the original clutter. Okay? They don't you know, deal with that a lot, but what's really going on here is they've proven the law of double negation. <coughs> okay? Then they have operations like taking minors of clutters. So the details are not so important, but roughly, very roughly, my if then is a generalization of them taking minors of matrices describing clutters. So what I'm saying is my hype operations correspond to well-known operations in mathematics outside of logic, right? So they, they, have, they, have, they have no business with, 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 with logic. So all of, many of these things about clutters and their logical properties that they come from a paper by Edmonds and Fulkerson. That's the Fulkerson of the Ford Fulkerson theorem, right? So Max flow min cut, okay? So I'm just mentioning that because it's sort of real math. But what, what they have been tracking is a kind of logical structure, and that logical structure is the structure of hype. So that's what I'm saying. Okay, and I, of course I like that yeah, as a mathematical philosopher. Okay, okay now more for the logic. Um, so you can define logical consequence and logical truth in the usual way. So it's truth preservation and being true at every state. No, no surprises. And then there are some easy observations that you, that you can give. So every logical truth must contain the conditional or the verum. Without the conditional or the verum, you don't have a logical truth. Okay? So, for example, there's no logical truth just with negation and conjunction or so. Okay? Um, if you forget about the conditional okay, um, uh, and, and the verum, you, you get first-degree entailment. So the logic of hype is an extension of first-degree entailment. Okay? And first-degree entailment, as you know, is this, this system that the different relevance logics that exist sort of converge on. So it's sort of the basis of relevance logic. So relevance logic is sitting sort of in the, in the middle of the system, as it were, okay? uh, if you forget the, uh, the conditional and, and the variable. Okay? And then certain rules compared to classical logic are lost, of course, excluded middle, law of non-contradiction, disjunctive syllogism, contraposition in its general form. None of them are logically valid anymore. Okay? However, say for some reason you want to restrict truth preservation to states that are... Um, um, that, that don't evaluate A and any A and not A simultaneously as being true. Okay? So you, you restrict your truth preservation to particular kinds of states. Okay? Then all of a sudden this chunk of syllogism becomes valid again. Okay? So basically, if you want to get some of these rules, you make some assumptions about what the state is like in which you're going to evaluate your things in the moment. Okay? Then you can get back these rules if you like. And I have more to say that in a minute. Okay. So, uh, axiomatically, you can give a, a Hilbert uh, axiomatic system for that that's sound and complete. Okay? And what you have for the conditional is basically what you need to prove the deduction theorem, because the deduction theorem is valid for the system. Conjunction and disjunction, no surprises. You have distributivity, the law of double negation, the De Morgan laws. You have an admissible form of contraposition. Okay? So, if, if A then B is provable okay, without premises, Okay. Then, if not B, then not A is provable. So it's an admissible rule. Yeah? 
and you have modus ponens in, in general form. Okay. Yes. Small question. Yes. Why do we need uh, the second formula as the axiom if we can derive? You don't. We can derive it from these two. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not claiming this is this is with, with redundancies. Mm -hmm. So the the idea is not. I don't give you an axiomatic system mm -hmm. without redundancies. That's most economic, but one that looks nice. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. But of course you can derive it in the usual way. Yes. Exactly. Okay, then you get nice metalogical properties. Okay, uh, so the deduction theorem, the system is sound and complete. The system has the finite model property, the set of logical truths is decidable, and it has the disjunction property. Okay, so some of these properties are much as we know them from intuitionistic logic, right? And indeed, this is not a big surprise because intuitionistic logic, as I'm going to tell you in, in, in a minute, is sitting within the system as well. Okay, so it's an extension of intuitionistic logic. Okay. Now, but before, uh, before I tell you about that, let me extend that now to the first order level. And that's very simple. You add a domain. Okay? Let's assume for every state we have one and the same domain for simplicity. Okay? So I don't deal with, with varying domains for the time being. Okay? Then instead of assigning by the V function a P or a P bar to a state, I will now assign what's called states of affairs, sometimes of facts in situation semantics to states. So things like this, where this is a predicate or it's negation. Okay? And these are objects from the domain. Okay? And these tuples are now via the V function assigned to, to states. Okay? That's the stuff that's there now. Okay? That's the only little, little change. And, um, um, and the semantic rules are as before. Of course, you, know, you have a state and a variable assignment now. And relative to those, you define truth values. You know, it's not a familiar story. Then the quantifiers behave just as you would expect them. There is no funny business going on with the quantifiers. Okay, so in, um, 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 you have what's look, what looks like the standard semantic rules from, from classical semantics. Okay, so this is not like intuitionistic semantics where you would change uh, uh, one of them in any way. Okay, so it's sort of the, the what you would expect if you go first order with the quantifiers. Okay, and then what you get is except for the pro uh, propositional logic, you get all the standard axioms for the quantifiers, no, no surprises, like classical logic. And you also have this here, so this kind of uh, interdefinability of the universal and the existential quantifier, modular negation. Okay? Um, from these, you can derive this law, for example. Okay? And that's sometimes known as, as uh, um, axiom scheme D, or the, the constant domain axiom. Okay? And it's typically something that you would mention because it's not contained in intuitionistic logic, but you can add it to intuitionistic logic. Okay? And then it would correspond to having a Kripke frame with, uh, with, a, with a fixed domain at, at every state. Okay? So this is, this is simply derivable in, in the system. Okay? And the system that I've just given you is sound and complete with respect to this extended semantics. Okay? And the proof is basically... Um, uh, so I'm building on, on Gernemann's proof. Uh, this, this soundness and completeness result that she had on uh, for intuitionistic logic with D, okay, and you know using the lemma of Rossi over Sikorsky, so sort of standard methods that you that you would apply here. Okay, now let me tell you why this system is, in my view, particularly nice for certain purposes. First of all, you can use it as a framework. Okay, what I mean by that is within the system you can discuss how various well-known existing logical formalisms relate to each other. Okay, so let me give you an example to give you a flavor for what I have in mind. So first of all, say you have a height model. In a height model, you do not have to have a least state, and you do not have to have a greatest state. But certain height models are such that they give you a least state and a greatest state, according to the partial order that you can define by fusion. Okay? Say you have a model where you have a least state and a greatest state. Okay? Now look at all these models, and look at truth preservation just in the least state, so you redefine logical consequence, not as truth preservation in all states, but only in least states, in the models, in the height models where there are least states. Okay? What's the logic for that? If you disregard the conditional, the logic is strong, cleanly logic. So if you forget about the conditional, strong, cleanly logic, so this well-known system of free-valued logic, right, coming from cleanly partial functions and so on, uh, that's, that's the logic that's sort of sitting in a height model if you look at the least states of a height model, if there are such. Okay? If you look at the logic of the greatest states, if there is a least state, you can always prove there's also a greatest state. Okay? If you look at the logic of truth preservation at greatest state, you get this system LP that Graham Priest has worked on a lot. So this is this uh, um, paraconsistent system. Okay? 
It's like the free valued logic where the B is interpreted as both true and false, and logical validity and logical consequence are defined differently from strong clean logic. Okay. Now, proof theoretically, what you need to add to, um, so again, forgetting about the conditional. The conditional is neither in LP nor in strong cleaning logic. They don't have a nice conditional. Hype does have a nice conditional. It's as nice as that of intuitionistic logic. But if you forget about the conditional, what you need to do is, if you add all axioms looking like this to hype, then you get strong cleaning logic. And if you add all the instances of the excluded middle to hype, then you get LP. Okay? But sort of within the system, as it were, you find somehow LP and strong clean logic sitting there. Okay? Classical logic. Okay? If you take a classical extensional model, just a model of first order logic, okay? then you can view of it as a hype model. And even if you take a set of classical models, like, a hype, like an intentional model, a set of classical models, you can turn that into a hype model. Okay? And in those my if-then collapses into the material if-then, and my negation collapses into classical negation. So in some sense, in some sense, it's a conservative extension of the classical case. Okay? And that's what I want. Okay? Now, I, I, the logic of such models that look like this, sort of classical hype models, is of course classical logic again. Okay? Even if you have an arbitrary hype model, and you look at truth preservations just as, as worldly states, right, that are neither... Um, uh, that are consistent and complete. Okay? Then again, truth preservation there is just classical logic if you forget about my conditional. Okay? So classical logic, in a sense, is in there. Okay? And proof theoretically, if you want to restore classical logic, you add all instances of the excluded middle and the intersubstitutivity of the conditional with the material conditional. Then you get back classical logic. Intuitionistic logic. So you can prove that if you take a Kripke model of intuitionistic logic with constant domains, you can always extend it to a hype model. Okay? So sort of you can think of Kripke models for intuitionistic logic as fragments of hype models. Okay? Um, if you restrict the context in which my negation occurs just to the logical thousand, remember this was defined as not verum. We are not this my new negation. Okay? Say this is the only context in which my negation occurs. You restrict the language. The language thus restricted has the property that on the propositional level, hype boils down to intuitionistic logic. They are the same logic. And on the, on the first order level, it's hype, uh, uh, hype corresponds to intuitionistic logic plus this, system, uh, this action scheme D for constant domains. So what I'm saying is, basically, if you restrict negation to the context of a falsum, okay, then you get intuitionistic logic back. It extends intuitionistic logic. Okay? What's new is sort of you have the new negation in, in, in hype unrestrictedly. Okay? So in some sense, in hype, you have two negations. You have the official one, this one, and you have the intuitionistic one if you define intuitionistic negation as usual by if A, then falsum. You have both negations around in hype, whereas in intuitionistic logic, you just have one of them. Okay? So from the viewpoint of hype, classical negation is the superposition of two concepts of negation, as it were. One is the intuitionistic one, and the other one is this one that satisfies the De Morgan laws, De Morgan negation. Okay? Um, in a classical context, they collapse into one and the same thing. In the hype context, they are two different concepts. Okay? In intuitionistic logic, you just deal with one of them. Okay? Um, in, in, in certain kinds of relevance logic, you just deal with the other, and in hype, you have both of them together. Okay? And none is stronger than the other, by the way. None is logically stronger than the other. Okay? And they are sort of dual in hype. Okay? So again, look at the model where there is a greatest state and a least state. Then you can prove that the least state satisfies not A with the official negation of hype, just in case the greatest state satisfies if A, then falsum. That's the intuitionistic negation of A sort of modulo, sort of the hype structure, in a sense, they, they relate to each other in a kind of dual manner. And that, I think, is, is, is a nice property. And there is more. So you can use it as a framework to discuss different logics. Okay? Final point, then, then I'm done. You can use hype now as a background logic for formal theories of truth. Okay? So I won't go into all the details, but the idea is you have the language of first-order arithmetic in the background. Okay? You want to treat it classically, say. You have a primitive truth predicate. So you're not defining truth, but you have a primitive truth predicate okay, that you can apply to, for example, names of uh, girdle codes of sentences where these sentences might contain the truth predicate again. Okay, so it's type-free. You can, you can apply the truth predicate 
um, uh, module naming to a sentence that again includes the truth predicate. Okay? And since you have arithmetic in the background, you have diagonalization, so you will have sentences that at least up to provable equivalence talk about their own um, uh, falsity, their own, their, their own being non-true. Okay? You have sentences that, talking, that say about themselves, I'm not true, a liar-like sentence. Okay? So that's the, that's the context. And now the question that philosophers have been interested in for a long time is, what does a, a, a good formal theory of truth semantically or proof theoretically look like in this kind of context, okay? where you have to deal with the semantic paradoxes? And then a famous answer to this question was given uh, by uh, Saul Kripke in the, in the 70s, where he determined these fixed point models for such languages with a type 3 truth predicate. Okay? So what he does was he takes his background semantics, for example, strong cleanly logic, but it could be a different system, and then shows that um, um, by certain monotonicity properties, you get fixed points of these jump operations that he defines. Okay? And these fixed point models have the nice property that if such a fixed point model, it's a three valued model now, okay, satisfies true of A, then it will also satisfy A and vice versa. So you get in a kind of, a kind of truth by conditional. Okay? And that's very nice and has been studied heavily. Okay. What's been criticized for a long time is that this if and only if in such fixed point models is in the meta language. It's not in the object language, right? And you couldn't easily put it into the object language because, for example, strong cleaning logic doesn't give you a nice conditional and hence not a nice enough biconditional that would do the trick. Okay, so this was sort of an open question. How could you deal with that? And in recent years, people have worked on that a lot. And for example, Hartree Field has. So what he did was he added a conditional to the Kripkean language, came up with a new kind of fixed point construction that's more elaborate, and uh, proved that I, I feel can even build up models that would satisfy the corresponding conditionals where now the conditional is in the object language. Okay, so he sort of improved over Kripke in that sense. Okay, the downside of his construction is that the conditional isn't so nice. Okay, so you don't have a deduction theorem, you don't have importation exportation. You know, certain nice properties that we normally cherish about the conditional, from a logical point of view at least, they, they drop out. Okay? And it's also well known that something needs to go. Okay? Something needs to go because, this is because of the Curry sentence, right? a sentence of the form that says about itself, if I'm true, then some absurdity like the Falsum. Okay? So a self-referential construction with the conditional now. Okay? And it's well known that because of present, the presence of formulas like that, you could not have a really nice conditional with you know, importation, exportation, and so on, a nice consequence relation in the usual sense, and all T by conditionals. That wouldn't fly because you know, there you would run into inconsistency again. So something needs to go. And what Hartree Field suggests is, well, let's, let's throw out some nice properties of the conditional, but have all instances of the T scheme, of the truth scheme. And what I'm now suggesting is doing it the other way around. Have a new conditional added to Kripke's language. I think Hartree Field and these people were right about that. We want to express that in the object language. But now the conditional should be nice, and in fact it will be my hype conditional. And by what I've already told you, that is a nice conditional according to all standards. Now, you couldn't have any more all instances of the T scheme. Something needs to go, remember? Okay? So let's not aim at all instances of the T scheme. Okay? And that's what you find in that theorem. Okay? And that's my final result. Okay? So you can build a hype model for type-free truth and um, arithmetic syntax such that at all states in the model, the following will be the case. First of all, you've got all instances of the truth scheme where A does not include the conditional. Where A does not include the conditional. So roughly these are all the A's that Kripke would have had before because he didn't really have a uh, proper conditional. Okay, sort of for all the Kripkean formulas, you get all the instances of the T scheme now expressible in the object language. Okay, so you fulfill the desire to improve upon Kripke. Okay. But you don't get all the instances where A might include the conditional. That's not what you get. Okay. Um, you get all the instances of the T-scheme satisfied if A does not include the truth predicate, but might include the conditional. You get all the instances of the T-scheme where A is hype-logically true, whether or not it contains the conditional or the negation or the truth predicate. Okay. And you also get some additional instances. For example, all the T-by conditionals looking like this you get, where B is an arithmetical predicate, an open formula that you can uh, express in the language of arithmetic. OK? 
Okay? So you do get some mixed instances of the truth scheme also, some interesting ones, where you have the conditional and the truth predicate being present simultaneously. Okay? And finally, you get all the internalized instances of the T scheme, as it were. You get always true, true A, equivalent true A, expressible in the object language, and being true in every state in the height model. Okay? Um, so this is a way of improving upon Kripke okay, with a nice conditional, but sort of going the other way around. Nice conditional, on the other hand, not all instances of the T scheme. And I think there's a rationale for not having all instances of the T scheme. The idea is that if this is the case in, a, in all states in the state space, including the least one, so simply everywhere, okay, then in my context, this really expresses that the left-hand side formula and the right-hand side formula have, in a sense, the same subject matters, they have the same truth makers, they have the same ways of being true, they express the same hyperintention. Okay? So in my case, the biconditional expresses a, a rather strong relationship between true of A and A. Okay? And it's not clear in general that for arbitrary A, true and of A and A will bear that relationship. Okay? So um, in particular, you can show that the truth value of true of A is always a local matter in my hype model. You always have to look at the state. You don't have to look at other states around it to evaluate that. But if A contains the conditional, remember I already told you, then this is non-local. You have to look at other states. Okay? So there's a kind of mismatch. The local side that you have on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side you have a non-local side if A contains the conditional. And that, I think, is the reason why you shouldn't expect all instances of the T-scheme to be true at all states whatsoever in the model. Okay? Because of this mismatch. It's simply not clear in my system anymore that true of A and A have, as it were, the same content. Okay. You can have that if both are local, but if A contains the conditional, that's no longer the case. Okay. So summing up, I've given you a system of hyperintentional semantics and logic, which I think is simple, formally nice, has nice uh, logical properties, is intuitive, think of the euler venn example and the graph theoretic example, and which includes various well-known systems, special cases or subsystems. So it's kind of a framework. Mathematicians have been studying similar formal structures before in different areas, okay? but they are describing without knowing it a logical structure, and it's the structure of hype. The system has applications in itself, for example, uh, to uh, amend and improve upon Kripke's theory of truth in a type 3 context. Um, and in the future, that's how I started my talk, hype might actually serve as a useful background system for certain hyperintentional operators. And one of them, I think, is, uh, will be causality operators. Okay? So overall, I hope, even if you come from the classical world, this should count as an attractive non-classical package.